All right, if y'all would turn with me to Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 through 18. And I hope everybody did their homework from last week. We'll talk about uh, what some of the different interpretations of 666 is tonight. So we had started looking at chapter 13 last week, and this prelude continues before the bowl judgments. We see that the devil made claim upon the sea, and rising out of the sea, we were introduced to the Antichrist, called the Beast, in chapter 13. And the Antichrist, we know, is the final world leader, and he will be uh, absolutely opposed to God and his people. And tonight we find another beast that connects very much to the Antichrist, which is the false prophet, here called the Beast from the Earth. So this is 11 through 18. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he has granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, and that the image of the beast should speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand and on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Talking about a mysterious passage, there has been so many interpretations of this passage over the time, uh, over the years since Revelation has been written. Uh, but this is talking first about the false prophet in verse 11. And the false prophet is this beast from the earth, another beast, and he will be a religious leader of the end times. So we have the final world leader, the political leader, the Antichrist, but the false prophet, prophet is the religious leader of satanic worship. That's absolutely what he is leading. And he will unite with the political and military aspect of the Antichrist. So religion and politics coming together. You know, we always talk about those are two things you don't talk about, right? People are always fighting about not wanting those two things to merge. But the end times, those two things absolutely merge together. The preterist view of this passage, and if you remember, preterists are those that believe that Revelation was written probably like 68 AD and that... 70 AD when the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem that revelation was fulfilled But that really doesn't follow very well because there's lots of stuff that hasn't taken place But the preterist view was that this false prophet represented the priest in Asia Minor who promoted emperor worship And you can see a very much a parallel of that, you know, we have types of antichrist and We really even have types of false prophets that have existed before and will exist one day because those priests were encouraging you know, the people to worship the emperor of Rome. So now we have this false prophet encouraging people to worship the Antichrist. Uh, early Protestant views of the false prophet, who do you think they thought the false prophet was? The Pope, right. And there's some that still take that interpretation. And I mean, there's a lot of power, obviously, in the Roman church. I think early on when the Protestant, you know, Reformation, you could really see the power that the Pope had at that time. It's really different than that now, but we don't know. That's just speculation in that. And it's absolutely the false prophet is going to be against God. No doubt about it. Some even say that the false, false prophet may just be a lieutenant to the military of the Antichrist. And it may be, but I think the easiest interpretation, the most plain, is that he's a religious leader. The religious leader of the end time religion. And, you know, we talked about last week the counterfeit fit that the devil makes of just everything of God. And this unholy trinity that we are seeing here. So we have the dragon, which is Satan, who represents the father. And then we have the Antichrist, the first beast, who represents the son. The son who was fatally wounded and resurrected. So we got counterfeits. And now we have the false prophet, who is a counterfeit of the spirit, who draws people to worship. 
counterfeits, parallels with everything. The unholy trinity, the dragon, the antichrist, and the false prophet. And we see that this false prophet, instead of rising from the sea, remember the sea represents evil and chaos, so it was very plain where the Antichrist was from. But rising from the earth shows the Satan making a full claim on all of creation. Because you remember in chapter 13, the beginning is the dragon who sees the beast rising from the sea. So he's making claim over the sea, and now the beast rising from the earth, Satan's making claim over the whole earth. Now we know who really owns all of creation is God. But he's making that claim. And it may be, some interpreters believe that perhaps the false prophet is still rising from the abyss, the, the place of the demons represented with the, the sea in the first part of chapter 13, but that the false prophet has a little more subtle origins. The fact that people may not realize what his deal is as quickly as they would the Antichrist. Rising up, you know, he's a religious leader. Perhaps he's making everybody sing Kumbaya in some manner. And people see this unification happening in the world. This is the false prophet. What he's doing. And the false prophet's also described as having two horns. Now, if you remember, the description of the Antichrist was a, a basically the exact image of the, the devil. The ten horns. So the false prophet seems to be weaker than the Antichrist in some manner. He doesn't have the same number of horns. And these horns also, being a lamb, would be small bumps. So the false prophet represents himself in a way that maybe seems gentle, at least at first. You know, he's not uh, initially a killing machine like the Antichrist with the political power and things that are moving is doing. You know, we see right now all the unrest in the world in uh, Russia and the Ukraine situation. We don't know what's going to happen in that. But you know, in the end, the Antichrist is going to have similar initiatives of taking over wherever, right? And bringing all these kingdoms under his rule. But this false prophet is going to fool people into thinking that he's bringing peace in some manner. And he's, he looks like a lamb. Now, what is that a counterfeit of? Christ. Absolutely. Christ. And you know, Jesus even said in Matthew 7 and 15 that false prophets would be what? Wolves in sheep's clothing. And that's absolutely the false prophet as well. He, he gives this impression of the fact that he's a lamb, but he's really a wolf. And it says that he spoke like the dragon, like a dragon. So he was Satan's mouthpiece, at least. He's in agreement with Satan. Everything that Satan wants, this false prophet is fulfilling. So he's definitely a, of demonic origin, but this is a man, more than likely, just like the Antichrist is a man. And perhaps he is possessed as well, like we said last week, the Antichrist might be possessed. But I got to thinking about this one aspect of it. So Satan is not omnipresent like God is. There's nothing in Scripture that gives us the impression that angels have omnipresence. So if the Antichrist happens to be possessed by Satan, the false prophet couldn't be possessed by Satan. But we know that there's de there are demons working for, the, for a Satan, so the demon possession could still happen without it being Satan himself, who we know possessed Judas. Scripture does describe that to us. But this is of demonic origin. Verse 12, he says that he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. So this power of the Antichrist, this worldwide influence, is still coming from the false prophet as well. And he, he causes worship. Now, when you think about causing worship, is he forcing people really to, to worship? Or is he leading this false religion? And I think probably the better understanding is that he's leading this false religion. But we see that he's deceiving people into coming into this false religion with these signs and, and wonders. And who are, who's he leading the people to worship? The one whose deadly wound was healed. That's the Antichrist. Remember this false image of Jesus who probably has a false resurrection. Many interpreters believe that is the case. That he didn't really die and come back to life. But people are worshiping him. The Antichrist. And he, the false prophet verifies these things in verse 13. performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Yet again, counterfeit of God's work. You remember Elijah called the fire down. So he's got great signs and wonders and miracles. And we see parallels of this in the Old Testament. You think about before the Exodus. When Moses went to bring Israel out of Egypt... He would perform a sign, and then what would the Egyptian magicians do? They perform a sign too. Was it real magic? Nah, that's kind of hard to say. Now, Satan definitely has supernatural powers. 
There's no doubt about that. And there's some weird stuff going on out there that people mess with voodoo and things of that nature. But you know what? There's probably a lot of, of trickery, sleight of hand, fooling each other. But do you remember, I like especially the account of when the staff turned into a snake and the Egyptians made their own staff into snakes. What happened to their staffs? They got eaten, didn't they? <laughs> God's power is, is greater than the power. So there's these counterfeits. And you also think about these signs and wonders that the false prophet's doing. And this time frame is really contrasting the two witnesses of God. You remember the two witnesses? They're performing miracles. They could call fire down from heaven as well. Very similar to Moses and Elijah. So he's making a contrast to them to convince the people. Don't follow them. Follow me. Follow, well, follow the Antichrist. So he's pointing them to the Antichrist. So he can call fire down from heaven. And again, Satan has supernatural powers. He is a spiritual being, but we don't know to what degree. Uh, these things are real signs versus falsehoods. But he's definitely deceiving people with whatever he's using. In verse 14, it says that he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. So it seems that he has been granted power in some way. And he deceives them, convinces them. And then he encourages them to make an image of the beast, an image of the Antichrist. And, you know, it seems like we're like far away from idol worship in the United States, and at least what we think. But, you know, idol worship still exists all over the world. Very much so. Like real idols built. I remember going to a Japanese restaurant in Greenville one time, and we'd eaten there several times. And I went around the corner of one of their counters and they had a Buddha statue there with the fruits that they would put before the, the Buddha. It gave me just the heebie-jeebies. I mean, it was just the fact that people are really doing that kind of thing, you know, even today. But at the end times, these people start to worship the beast and he encourages them to build an image of the beast. This sounds very similar to in Daniel. Daniel chapter 3, when Nebuchadnezzar had the gold statue built. And you remember what happened if you didn't worship the gold statue? He went into the fire pit, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We know the story very well. So he's making some kind of image that the people have to worship. And uh, some interpreters say that this image may be the throne that the Antichrist sits on, uh, particularly during the abomination of desolation time. I think when you look at verse 15, probably the better plain reading of this is that it really is just a statue of the Antichrist. Because in verse 15, we see he's granted power again. Some kind of power to give breath to the image of the beast. So it's not just the fact that he speaks, but it says he has breath. Breath. So this image is in some way alive. And it may again be some illusion trickery with that. Maybe a miracle. But he's been given power to fool people. Now, they're worshiping an idol that, don't, that doesn't speak and suddenly is speaking. You think people are going to be amazed at that? And fall down to that? You know, actually there's lots of uh, records of idol worship over the centuries where statues were hollow and there was a secret compartment where somebody would crawl in it and they would speak to the followers so they thought that the statue was talking to them. Also there's a record of a professional ventriloquist basically doing the same thing and throwing their voice to these false idols to have people fooled. So you know there's lots of ways we could fool somebody with that today when you think with the technology that we have. But whatever it is, it is convincing people and they're falling down. And if they refuse to worship, in verse 15 it says, uh, the cause of many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Now, from the way you read this, it sounds like the image itself is killing the people that refuse to worship. So maybe there's fire coming out of this image. We don't know, really know, but again, very similar to Nebuchadnezzar, who threw people in the, fl uh, the flaming fire. So if you don't worship, you die. Antiochus Epiphanes that we spoke about last week, who was a type of Antichrist, he killed people that refused to worship him. We also have a letter to the Emperor Trajan in the 98 to 117, so this is very close to this time frame, uh, ordering people to kill Christians that refuse to worship Roman gods. So, you know, the death of people for not worshiping is not anything new at all, and it's only going to intensify in the end. And actually, in Muslim places in the world today, there are people that are being killed if they refuse to become Muslim. That's been happening for a long time, and it will continue on like that into this end time. Verse 16, 
So they have to, they're worshiping the Antichrist. They have this image they have to bow down to. Now all those that are worshiping the Antichrist, the false prophet causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. So, so nobody's left out at all in this. He causes them or implements the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast. And you can contrast this with the mark of God, where God marks out his people, his special people. And I want you to understand, too, that in the end times, there's no such thing as a neutral stance. You either receive the mark of the beast or the mark of God. And that's really true now. There's no neutral stance. You're either with God or you're against God. So the end times, if you are with God, if you are a Christian, you are not going to receive the mark of the beast. So don't worry about that. If you're right with God, you are not going to receive the mark of the beast. Now, it's going to be very trying times, no doubt about that. But those that have been sealed by God are protected by God. So you will not receive the mark of the beast if you are a Christian. And also understand that this mark of the beast is not some kind of secret mark. I think that's the thing people worry about the most, that somehow they're going to secretly have uh, the mark implanted in them or on them. It's very, very plain. Look at the passage here that false worship is taking place, that you're worshiping the Antichrist, that the, you have the statue of the Antichrist. The people are worshiping, and if they don't worship, they're killed. So there's no like sneaking in the back door of the, of the mark of the beast. It's happening, it's connected to everything else that's going on. So I wanted to say right now, it's not the COVID vaccine, okay? <laughs> and it's not the, the vaccine passports or anything like that. We don't know how the mark of the beast is going to be implemented exactly. But again, it's not going to be a secret mark. And here comes a, a question with it. Is this literal or symbolic when it talks about the mark of the beast? Because the mark of God, his name upon their foreheads, is probably symbolic. So talking about the mark of the beast, is it symbolic? It may be. But I think that as we see where religion and economics are merged together in verse 17, it's probably more a literal mark that's happening. And at this time frame, slaves would be branded or tattooed with a mark. So that would make a lot of sense to the early readers if you're going to receive a mark that you're being branded or have a tattoo. And today we think a lot about microchips. I think that's a very plausible possibility. Because with microchips, there's some companies now that instead of having your badge, you got your microchip implanted in your hand and you go into work and you scan in that you're at work and you scan out when you leave. And that's already turning into opportunities for commerce. You go to the, the cafeteria of your place and you order your food with that chip that's in your hand. So there's, there's some stuff already going on technology-wise with that. So it, it may be a, a literal mark in some way. Seventh-day Adventists, they keep coming up in this end-time messages. And actually, a lot of false religions do show up when you look at Revelation because they have some very strange interpretations of it. But they believe the mark of the beast is going to be legally enforced Sunday worship. They're very serious about the Sabbath, aren't they? <laughs> about Saturday, worshiping on Saturday. They've got a lot of other strange beliefs, but they think that's what the mark of the beast is going to be. Is that the false prophet is going to make everybody worship on Sunday. And I think that doesn't follow at all with this. Uh, but these, these mark that's going to be received is going to be received by the false worshipers. It's not by the Christians, not by those who refuse to receive the mark. And it says on their right hand or their forehead. And if you remember, right hand has power in ancient literature. So they would understand that, this, that your power is being given to the Antichrist. Or on your forehead. You're being identified to who you are, who you belong to. Uh, actually, in the first century, prostitutes in Rome would often wear a headband that had their name on it. So you knew they were prostitutes. It was very plain that they were. So it's very plain that they belong to the beast. However, that mark may be. And I was thinking, too, about a parallel that is uh, symbolism, but was taken literal in Deuteronomy. When God tells Israel uh, about having the scripture, you know, on the doorpost and on the frontlets of their head. Do you know what Isra uh, the Israelites did with that? They made little boxes and put scripture in it and wore them around their heads. The frontlets on their heads. Now, that's not what the scripture really meant. You know, when you're keeping God's word before you all the time. But they took it literal with that. So there could be a mix of symbolism and literal interpretation of this too. But verse 17 again, 
I think it is definitely a literal mark in some way because we see that religion and economics merge together. Now, there's some hard choices that come up. And the churches in Asia Minor that received this, the original um, book of Revelation, do you remember one of the things that was going on were, was the trade guilds? And basically, you could not participate in the trade guilds unless you particip participated in the pagan worship, the time of feast together, worshiping in the temple, whatever those things may be. If you didn't do that, you couldn't have your own company, your own you know, business that you could run in that area and you couldn't survive so it's kind of like a, a union in the sense but that's very much probably what the early readers were thinking about with this that suddenly we can't uh, participate in commerce because we're not worshiping these false gods these are hard choices and you can even think about in the united states t today so there are christian business owners they're being targeted for their beliefs we know the whole thing about the making the cake for the gay wedding and how that person's life has basically been ruined because of their choice with that. But do you see how religion, and this is secular religion, this is the atheistic religion that really exists all over the world, is saying, you can't do that. You can't be, you can't operate your business that way. It's just going to get worse. The government's going to have so much control over you, so much control that they're not going to be able to even participate in business or maybe even work if they don't worship the Antichrist. And it says that, so all these that are going to be participating, uh, participating in economics will be receiving a mark or a name or the number of the beast to buy and sell. So again, the microchip, I think, makes a lot of sense in that. You know, right now they're actually talking about a neurological implant where you can use your phone just in your head. You know, see, this, the technology... When John wrote this, I imagine John had no idea that anything like this would exist one day. But these things are already, the technology is there for things to happen like that. Where you can't buy or sell unless you have that chip, and unless you are marked. Uh, Pope Martin the, the V, in the 1400s, he actually excluded heretics. So heretics would be someone that's against the Catholic Church, and they may or may not have been against God's word, and that's really hard to tell, but he excluded heretics from commerce and civil office. You see, the religious leader with power, you can see governments with power excluding you from commerce. And I was thinking too about this with the mark of the beast. So if you're not being able to participate in commerce, some people think, well, I'm just going to live off the land. You know, you're going to hunt and fish and farm and things like that. Well, we already know the government owns our land in some way already too. How many of y'all like paying property taxes? <laughs> <laughs> all over the world, that's just going to get worse and worse. And you think about with hunting, fishing, and farming, you buy a lot of products to do those things. It's not that we couldn't do those things, but it's going to be difficult, very difficult, if you cannot go out and buy ammunition, go out and buy seeds, go out and buy just all the different things you need for hunting, fishing, and farming. So it's going to be a difficult time. And I want you to just imagine this too. We think about the food, not being able to work, but imagine being cut off from technology. Some of us may not care about that so much, but I can tell you, my generation, the generation under me, if we didn't have the internet, most people would die already. But imagine they're not going to be able to have access to the internet. You're not going to be able to stream your favorite shows or watch your ball game anymore. You're not going to be able to use your phones. You're not going to be able to have a TV. You're probably not going to be able to purchase a house or a car. This is difficult, very difficult. So, you know, trying to fly under the radar is going to be very, very hard for people in the world. And there's probably going to be a lot of people that starve to death during this time. Verse 18. So what is this number of the beast? Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Here is wisdom. What is this wisdom that's being revealed? The wisdom ultimately is to not be deceived. That's the ultimate wisdom for us. We are not deceived by this antichrist in receiving this mark. This is the, what wisdom really is, to resist, to be faithful to God throughout. Now, how do we calculate this number? We recognize the false worship. When we know God's word, we recognize those that are telling you to worship someone other than God. We recognize that. that's wisdom. But 666, what does this number mean? So, could mean the unholy trinity that we've been talking about. 
So 777 is often used as a reference to God as perfection. And you have the three in one there, 777, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 666 is the number under perfection. You got the dragon, the antichrist, and the false prophet. So the 666 may represent in general that whole group there. It may represent a duration of time. Many have interpreted in this way and tried to figure out when the end of the world was going to come by the number 666. And I don't think that that one really follows very well. 666 definitely represents a man in general, as in imperfect, incomplete. And we know the Antichrist is a man. So it may be just representing in that way, saying that this is a, a man who is not perfect, who is not God, that people were worshiping. Another way you can look at the incompleteness of 666 is think about, as we've been unpacking in Revelation, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. If you only have six seals and six trumpets and six bowls, what are you missing at the end? The kingdom coming. The completion. So all these things continue just to show an incompleteness, an unholiness. And it may be equivalent to a name. And this is probably the most popular interpretation of 666, is that there's some kind of name hidden in code here. But when the Antichrist is revealed, it's no mystery that he's the Antichrist. When that happens, when that end happens, and when this false worship comes, there's no question that who he is. So this code that we're trying to figure out now, we'll, go, we'll know if we're here at the end of the world, who this Antichrist is. But I'm probably going to butcher this. Uh, Mr. Fred, correct me. Is it Gematria? Which one? Gematria. So Gematria is giving a number to a letter or to a name to calculate who this person is. So it could be what you're calculating in English, in Greek, in Hebrew, different ways like that. Obviously, English didn't even exist when Revelation was written. Did you ever think about that? English didn't even exist yet. It's a long time later. Uh, there's actually a website you can go to that has a calculator, so you can plug your name in. I plugged everybody's name in here tonight, and nobody equals 666, so congratulations. <laughs> Not in any of the languages. Uh, the most popular interpretation of that is Nero Caesar. So Nero Caesar, who was a persecutor of the early church, they believed was the Antichrist in some sense. But there's a big problem with that. Because if Revelation was written in 98 AD, which is probably when it was, he'd been long dead. He committed suicide. But here's an interesting thing about Nero, is that many people believe that he just faked his death and that he was going to come back one day. That sounds very similar to, to what's going on in Revelation there. But he's dead. He's dead as a doornail. <laughs> Nero Caesar, to convert his name to 666, you have to use the Hebrew letters. Now, there's a problem with that. Revelation is written in Greek, written to Greek speakers, Greek readers. So they wouldn't automatically try to apply a name to Hebrew. Some say, oh, it's just very plain to the early audience what the 666 meant. I don't know that that's really the case, especially if you're leaning towards Nero Caesar. And actually, in Revelation 9 and 11 and 16 and 16, John references Hebrew and Greek. So he really points out when he's saying this is something in Hebrew. So you would think that he would probably put in here this name as being in Hebrew. Doesn't mean that he would, absolutely, but that's, you know, an assumption. So Nero Caesar is one interpretation, but he's already dead and gone. Uh, later on, interpretations of Muhammad, uh, the leader of, the, of Islam, was translated to 666. Hitler, various popes. And I mentioned last week Ronald Reagan. If you take his first, middle, and last name, the six letters, six letters, six letters... You know, there's just all kind of strange interpretations. So I asked y'all for homework last week. Did anybody find any interesting interpretations of 666 to a name? Anybody? Not to a name, but it's interesting if you look at uh, most human, uh, all humans are uh, uh, carbon-based. Mm -hmm. And periodic table, six is, is carbon. And carbon has six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons. Okay, so people are carbon-based. Carbon is number six on the periodic table, and you have six neutrons, six electrons, and six, six protons. And the sixth <laughs> six letter in the Hebrew alphabet is W-A-W. It's our W. So every time you 
So the Hebrew letter that represents our W, people think about the internet, www666. You know, you don't even have to type that in anymore. You just type in your, yeah. Anybody else find any interesting ones? Have ever heard any interesting ones? Well, the other one on the Caesar Nero, mm -hmm. that has a real fallacy because Caesar is a title. It's not a name. Mm -hmm. That's true. His name, his name was not Caesar Nero. His title was Caesar Nero. You really have got to force it to work. Yeah. Right. Did you, this is just another interesting thing with Caesar. Did you realize that that may not be the original pronunciation of Caesar? Many think, uh, the linguists think it may have been Kaiser, the original way to pronounce Caesar. And that's just kind of a little tidbit there. Anybody else? You'll hear them. I mean, go, you go Google on the, on the internet. You'll find a lot of interesting interpretations. There was one for Donald Trump, but I could not find it again. <laughs> I plugged his name into that calculator and it didn't come out either. But, uh, you know, there's lots of speculation that Antichrist is going to be a Roman and that he may even be a homosexual, like we mentioned last week. We don't know. There's speculation. But in the end, we are going to know who the Antichrist is. Whoever's here is going to know who the Antichrist is because this worship is going to be very plain. And, you know, it's easy to translate things to 666. You know, you've got to force and kind of manipulate sometimes with like Caesar. But it's not really that easy to do it backwards to do the deciphering part and that's really where we're at we're just speculating when we're trying to decipher the 666 and what it really means and here's another kind of uh, monkey wrench in the mix of people trying to calculate 666 is that there's actual a textual variant so it means that some of the oldest manuscripts of revelation have a variant to 666 it's actually listed as 616 so one of the oldest, uh, very, oldest passages we have is from the 3rd century of Revelation, and it's got 616. Interestingly enough, people have forced Nero Caesar to be translated with that again as well. But we don't know. We don't know who this is going to be exactly, but it represents a man, and that man is the Antichrist, and his identity will be revealed one day. And remember, at the end, there is no neutral position. There's not. You're either for God or you're for the devil. Ultimately, it's not just the Antichrist. You're either for God or you're for the devil. And Christians will not receive the mark of the beast because they will endure to the end. We have been sealed for the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. And God is the one who, who brings us to completion. Because here's the reality. If I could lose my salvation, I would. But God's the one who keeps us. When we come to him in faith, he's the one that helps us, takes us, and helps us to endure to the end and protects us. So let us be encouraged in knowing that God wins and we are on God's side. Father, thank you for your word tonight. And I thank you for the fact that we know that you have all things under control. We may not understand the why of things that happen in the world, or even as we look at this passage, passages from the end of the world of why you allow certain things to happen. But we know that you have a time and you have a purpose and that you will serve justice completely. And I pray that you help us to have confidence in who we are in you, Lord. Help us never to forget that we have been sealed for the day of redemption. And that you will continue to guide us. You will continue to help us to, to, come, to come to you, Lord. Even when we fail, we will continue to come back to you. Because our hearts have been changed. We are new creations. And I pray that you would just guide us as we look at your word. That you would encourage us through our trials. And help us to speak encouragement into our loved ones as well those around us and in our church and help us just to continue to be a light in the darkness in jesus name i pray amen